Hello, this is Angela Erickson, and you're listening to Live a Little, where we talk about church history and the lives of the saints, as well as current events. Our hope is to inspire a new generation of saints to take up the torch that has been handed on from generation to generation, and ultimately to carry the light of Christ boldly into the darkness of the modern day in the same spirit as those who have preserved the faith since the days of our Lord. Um, We're really excited, when I say we, I mean I, (laughs) that you're joining us today because sadly, Daria is unable to join me for this recording um, because of, you know, motherhood. That's kind of how things go. Motherhood is not easy. And, you know, our kids need us. And sometimes when they need us a lot, especially at night, um, we just don't have it in us to do anything else in the morning. So uh, here we are today. uh, And I thought... um, you know, when Daria and I, we were actually planning on recording something else on Gnosticism, those those episodes that we've been wanting to get out to you for so long because there's so much to talk about. Um, they just haven't happened because we both have a lot going on. Uh, but I thought, even though she said she couldn't join me today for that, I thought, well, you know what? Just because she can't join us doesn't mean there aren't things that we can't talk about. And something that has been on my mind is uh, Mother's Day, actually. So kind of fitting with why Daria is unable to join today. Um, You know, motherhood is difficult. And um, this isn't going to be an episode where I sit there and talk about how difficult motherhood is. Uh, But what I do want to talk about is Mother's Day. Um, I think it's kind of top of the mind for everybody right now. We just celebrated Mother's Day. And I hope that you had a beautiful Mother's Day. Um, I know I did. We actually... um, I mean, we didn't do a whole lot on Mother's Day, to be honest, but my husband surprised me with a beautiful hydrangea tree, which I've always wanted. Um, And of course, my children, they had their own ideas of how to honor me on Mother's Day. It's actually kind of funny because we go to a homeschooling co-op once a week and they have three classes that they are a part of. And um, (laughs) in one of their classes, it's actually an art class. And you know, they do crafts basically because my oldest is five and a half and the next one that's in class is four years old. And in their class, they made these cute little cards for moms. And then they made these flowers made out of like tissue paper and uh, like watercolor paints or something. I don't know. Anyway, they're, they're really cute. But they came home and they were so excited to show me their flowers that they had made. And by the time we had gotten home, they had decided that they wanted to keep the flowers for themselves. So it was kind of like a happy Mother's Day. I made this for you, but I'm going to keep it (laughs) kind of a thing, which to me is just so typical for, you know, I don't know if that doesn't encapsulate motherhood. I'm not really sure what does. Um, Thankfully, after Mother's Day happened, they decided that they were no longer interested in the flowers that they had made me. And they decided that I could, in fact, keep the flowers that they had made me. So um, now they're up there with all my other plants and stuff. But anyway, I just thought that was so funny. So kind of with that in mind, Mother's Day, I wanted to talk about the history of Mother's Day because I find it pretty interesting. Um, And then I kind of wanted to talk about it kind of in the realm of today and what's it like culturally to be a Catholic viewing Mother's Day um, in a secular sense. And then what does that mean for us as we embrace the the identity of our, you know, that our Lord has bestowed upon us as women. And, you know, I think this episode will be interesting for anyone who has a mother in their life, uh, which would be everybody, um, whether you yourself are a mother or you're married to a mother, or you are a child with a mother, um, I think we can all have, you know, there will be some insight for everybody. So if you like what we're talking about here on Live a Little, please hit subscribe if you have not already. Make sure you're getting the notifications whenever we do uh, put out a podcast. And make sure you share this with your friends. We would so appreciate that. Uh, We don't get any traction if you're not sharing with your friends and family. And, um, you know, we honestly couldn't do this without you. Like that's the, that's the root of it. And we would really love to see this podcast grow. And while we know that that means, uh, putting out more content, um, 
that's that's our end of things, but we would also really appreciate you sharing this with people because, um, yeah, we just can't get anywhere. And kind of a, just a sidebar, I actually, I recently quit the radio show I was doing every week um, because I want to dedicate more of my time to, uh, to this and to doing some of these other smaller projects that I have going on. Um, but my hope is that I can also contribute more to the show, which I'm really excited about. So please, uh, please help us out. We really appreciate it. Uh, so from that, after that little plug, I guess I'll get into the history of Mother's Day. So if we go back in time, uh, pretty much all of history, I, you've seen femininity, uh, fertility, always being honored in cultures, especially various ancient cultures. You have you know, Gaia, Mother Earth, kind of that god. And then uh, the Greeks and Romans have their own goddesses of fertility and, and things like that. Um, and so this has pretty much universally been recognized, motherhood, as something that is really powerful. It's a powerful force, right? Because there is not really any other force as powerful as the ability to bring life into the world, right? That's honestly what's so amazing about being human is that we have the gift of being co-creators with God and stop. Um, that is something that is unique among God's creatures. Um, not to say that animals don't have that capacity, but obviously human beings being made in the image and likeness of God, we have this capacity to also bring other images of God into the world. Um, that's part of why Satan hates us so much. And universally, you can see through all of human history that this understanding, this deep reverence for this gift. I mean, yes, licentiousness and, and its distortion in terms of uh, sexuality and sexual licentiousness has always been there uh, as well. But that's the Christian understanding of the human person and who we are is really unique. And when we talk about all of the um, understanding of the human person throughout human history. So I wanted to underline that point because that kind of is a stepping stone to what we see in the 1600s in, in the UK, uh, which is kind of where Mother's Day somewhat originated. I mean, so what we see is that initially in the 1600, in the 1600s over in the UK, um, they started what was um, a, a, the fourth Sunday of Lent, actually, Families would travel from their parish to their mother parish or the parish of their family origin, and they would go have kind of like family reunions, basically. Um, and this was considered uh, Mothering Sunday in the UK. So Mothering Sunday, families would pack up, they would pilgrimage to their mother church, they'd have family reunions. And even even domestic servant workers were let off of work so that they could go see their mothers because these were usually daughters or, you know, women who were doing housework as, as servants and domestic servants uh, for people. And they would be allowed to go to their mother church to celebrate. So now it's considered a secular holiday, of course. Um, but this always comes before May Day. It's the fourth Sunday of Lent, and it is still celebrated in a lot of places today. Now in the U.S., we see kind of the origins of Mother's Day um, in the late 1800s, or at least it's kind of germinating here with a woman named Anna, Anna Jarvis. So Anna Jarvis in the late 1800s, towards the end of the century, she wanted to start a day or a way to memorialize and honor mothers um, because she had a, a deep love and reverence for her own mother. Uh, her mother died in 1905, and I, Anna Jarvis is described as having watched the struggles and sufferings of her mother. Her mother had 13 children, and only four of them survived to adulthood. And over time, she and her brother, who was a doctor, decided to implement things like different mother mother workshops of sorts so they could train families and women how to um, make sure that they were practicing good hygiene with their children and in their homes. Because at this time, let's you kind of have to understand in context, typhoid was a huge problem, typhoid fever. People were dying. 
Um, and so they wanted to do the best that they could to protect families for from from this illness uh, in general. So these informational sessions were called Mother's Day Work Clubs. And and this uh, this kind of was the beginning of uh, some of her activism, I guess you could sort of say, towards acknowledging the vital role that women and mothers play in their lives and in the lives of their children. Now, kind of coalescing at the same time in the in the late 1870s was Julia Ward Howe. She was an abortionist, or I'm sorry, an abolitionist, a feminist, sorry, that's <laughs> Freudian slip, um, and suffragette who actually wrote the lyrics for the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So she also penned something that is called the Mother's Day Proclamation. And uh, in this proclamation, she called on mothers everywhere to do what they could to bring together men, families from the Union and the Confederacy to come together for peace and wanted to create this day. She wanted to implement and, and create this day called Mother's Peace Day. So... At the same time, Anna Jarvis, the one I was just talking about, organized something called Mother's Friendship Day. Uh, and, and on this day, mothers met with former soldiers from the Union, Union and the Confederacy to encourage rec reconciliation. So you see these movements coalescing. And I find something so beautiful and maternal about um, these movements. Now, Anna Jarvis, she, she never was a mother. Um, and sadly, towards the end of her life, she died penniless in a sanatorium like it's, it's really sad actually but um but between these two women who were you know suffragettes fighting for rights things like that um which you know we have plenty we could talk about feminism things like that but at least in this situation in this circumstance there's something really beautiful to be said that these women were fighting for peace right and isn't that so often the role of mothers like I have watched in my own life situations in which there was strife between children and the agony that the mother experiences when her children are not at peace. And we know that our Lord, yes, he came to bring about division, but also he's the Prince of Peace. And so we know and understand as mothers that where there is truth, there is peace. And where there is truth, there's also love. And so I just find it, I found it really interesting and, and quite beautiful, to be honest, um, that they were both fighting for peace in the midst of civil conflict. And, you know, interestingly enough, because we're at a time in our nation's history where, um, you know, there is a lot of strife, even between families, yes. Uh, and nationally, you know, between political parties. I don't know what would it be like if we had some kind of a civil war again. I don't know how that would work because obviously you don't have it geographical in that sense that it was in the civil war. Uh, so anyway, I just find it interesting because the lines, there are lines today and the lines look different, but there's with that conflict, it, it's kind of highlights to me the, the role that mothers have in bringing about peace. And I'd like to see more women strive for that and bringing that about today. And and we can talk more about that here in a little bit. But Anna Jarvis, it was kind of interesting. So she established then Mother's Day at her church where carnations were given out. Um, white carnations kind of became the emblem for her movement. Um, and why she described it or why she chose the white carnation, I think is really beautiful. So here's what she, she explains why she explains she chose a white carnation to kind of, um, I don't know, encapsulate her movement for mother's day. And, and she said this, it's whiteness is to symbolize the truth, purity and broad charity of mother love. It's fragrance, her memory and her prayers. The carnation does not drop its petals but hugs them to it to its heart as it dies. And so too, mothers hug their children to their hearts, their mother love never dying. When I selected this flower, I was remembering my mother's bed of white pinks. I, I just found that so moving. It's insightful. And um, I've never really thought about that. To be honest, I've never particularly loved carnations. And I, <laughs> I, uh, 
I hate to say this, but every time I leave on Mother's, you know, Mother's Day Sunday for mass, I was like, oh, I don't want another carnation. I mean, they're okay. They've grown on me over time because my love of of gardening has grown a lot over the years and an appreciation for seeing the world just bloom in the spring with with life. But (laughs) this really put a new, um, I don't know, like a, a new respect for me anyway in terms of of the carnation so I just thought that was really beautiful and maybe you'll remember that the next time you see carnations out on um, Mother's Day so with that over time Anna Jarvis actually fought with people in the country include including Eleanor Roosevelt um, kind of calling people out uh, on the commercialization of this holiday so initially Anna Jarvis did this she established it you know, these different Mother's Peace Day workshops and all these other things to help mothers in terms of, you know, bringing about peace from soldiers, but also, like I said, the the workshops for teaching moms good hygiene for them and their children. Um, but she did in her Episcopal church uh, es- establish Mother's Day and they handed out white carnations and this grew across the country. And so it became very well known across the country. It became widely celebrated, uh, even so much so that Eleanor Roosevelt decided to start fundraising for charities on Mother's Day. And Anna Jarvis, this founder, uh, was extremely upset. I mean, she was very upset about the commercialization of Mother's Day and greeting card companies, developing cards and making money and candy companies making money off of this idea of hers that was really rooted in just loving your mother and and showing reverence to mothers everywhere. <laughs> so she was, I want to I want to double check the time frame out here, but in she was involved in 33 lawsuits by the time it was 1944. Uh, and, and she actually is said to have written, quote, to have Mother's Day, the burdensome, wasteful, expensive gift day, gift day that Christmas and other special days have become is not our pleasure. She wrote this in the 1920s. If the American people are not willing to protect Mother's Day from the hordes of money schemers that would overwhelm it with their schemes, then we shall cease having a Mother's Day. And we know how. <laughs> Which is so crazy. You know, like she was very adamant about this. Um, And of course, we know today that her efforts were unsuccessful in that regard. Um, There's still a lot of money being made on on carnations and flowers and chocolate, wine and everything else on Mother's Day. Um, But, you know, sadly, such is life. It kind of reminds me of Linus and his quest uh, to, or not Linus, excuse me, Charlie Brown on his quest to understand the why Christmas is Christmas. And you see in the books by what, Charles Schultz, right? Um, his quest to understand, he's, he's depressed. He's asking Lucy for help. He just doesn't understand the commercialism of Christmas. What does it all mean? And what it is, what is it all about? And Linus says, preaches the gospel of Luke, right? Uh, and explaining why Christmas is what it is. Um, and uh, yeah, I just love that story. But it, that's, of course, what comes to my mind because you have people like Lucy who are advocating for the commercialization or, or um, oh, Charlie Brown's younger sister, whatever her name is. I can't remember. Sally, I think. Um, and then you have people like Linus who quiet and uh, reserved but know the truth and, and are willing to proclaim it when necessary. I just find it really interesting and beautiful. But Anyway, I digress. That is the history behind Mother's Day for the most part. Um, You see mothers fighting for things over and over again. It's kind of wrapped up in the suffragist movement and feminism and all this stuff. And that's kind of where we get to today, right? I don't know about you, but Mother's Day just feels a little different to me. And I mean, I this was my sixth Mother's Day, I guess I could say. Um, as a mom. And I just, I don't know, like, I'm trying to be really honest, but it just didn't feel like, I don't know, I don't want to say it didn't feel like there was anything much celebrating. Like, I think motherhood should be celebrated in in a sense. Um, 
But when I look at how the world has perverted motherhood, I have a hard time like getting on board with that, I guess. I mean, for goodness sake, they started calling it birthing person's day. And that's a, that's what I want to talk about today a little bit. Um, because Mother's Day is very different than, first of all, what it was intended to be. And, and this reverence towards mothers and honoring your mother and the women who have come before you so that you can exist. <laughs> but really, it's sadly, like everything else, it's just so superficial. Like I don't, it lacks the depth that it was intended to have, right? Like I look at birthing person's day and I think the irony so much in the world today is that we have been reduced so much to our bodies, like this utilitarian notion of who we are. And it really kind of goes back to feminism and some of these other things that are sort of embedded in feminism. So I want to explore some of these things. Like the first thing I want to talk about is this dualist sense of who we are. And this kind of goes back to Gnosticism. And I'm sure Daria and I will talk about it more in the upcoming episodes. I know we've been teasing episodes on Gnosticism for like the last forever episodes, like since we started recording together, it seems like. But when you divorce, we're talking about different types of divorces. Okay. So first we have the divorce of the human person in a bodily sense from their soul. So we as Christians understand that we, our souls and our bodies are perfectly integrated. That has, that is why God created us body and soul. That's why he became incarnate to show us himself as a body and soul, right? Like he, he became incarnate so we could both touch him physically and meet him spiritually. Okay. That's why the sacraments confer actual grace. They are outward signs of an interior reality. They express what they are and what they, what they do, what they confer. Okay. That's what is such in a large way. I think the genius of being Catholic is like the, the Catholic understanding of the human person and how the church tends to their needs as a Catholic is unlike anything you're going to find in any other religion. Okay. It has such a unique, true, deep, integral understanding of who the human person is and how God created us. Right? So there's the first divorce of of the body from the soul. And when you divorce those things, then kind of anything goes. I mean, your body might be physically a woman, but your soul might say you're you're a guy, right? And so here we have this transgender issue. And I always find it so ironic going back to birthing person's day where we have, you know, it's not about being a mother anymore. Now, now you can be a man who is better at being a woman than a woman is, right? And you have men, quote unquote, transgender men who are now, quote unquote, chest feeding their children, right? Like it's, it is such an upside down world. I just, how did we get here? Honestly, feminism and licentiousness. <laughs> like I am the most anti-feminist human being you'll ever meet, which is so funny because I used to regard myself as a, a pro-life feminist. And today is exactly why I'm going to outline, I, I'm going to outline for you why you can't be a Catholic feminist, right? Like this is, because even if you're, you claim to be for example, a Catholic feminist as I did, and you, as I did, and you don't accept that abortion and contraception are okay. All right, that's that's fine. Like I understand, I was there too, where I rejected abortion, I rejected the use of contraception. I was a good little Catholic, but I I wanted to have that label of a feminist because I thought somehow that made me more relevant. If I'm being honest, like if I'm if I'm being super honest about why I I chose to call myself a Catholic feminist. Is because I wanted to feel relevant and because I thought you could reconcile the two in some manner. And the reality is, is you just can't. Because the what I have come to understand is that anything that I don't like in society about how women are treated or whatever, it's honestly predicated on feminism. 
like it's this weird cycle where I'm like I'm rejecting this thing and yet the reason but I want to embrace this feminist label so I'm actually kind of perpetuating this ideology without realizing it and the same ideology is the ideology that is getting me back to what I don't like in the first place for example if because that might sound a little convoluted like women in the workforce young women young moms in the workforce at astronomical rates okay when they have young children at home that they could be take they could be taking care of i'm not talking about the women who are working because they actually they have to work okay like we sadly live in a time where it's almost impossible for many families to live on one income um at least that's what I've heard. I don't know. Sometimes I think maybe people are just afraid of making those sacrifices. Like they like living a particular way. And so it's, and it's easier to live that way when you have two incomes. I don't know. Um, But let's say you are legitimately in a place where you haven't discerned or where you have discerned you and your husband both have to be working in order to raise your family. And I'm trying to be as sensitive as possible because I understand People have different situations and circumstances. And so I just want to caveat, if this is you, talk to your priest, spend a lot of time in prayer, and really discern in the depths of your heart what the Holy Spirit is telling you about your motherhood and what you should be doing. Um, I know I had to do this. And at the end of the day, I just could not justify being a co-parent with my daycare provider. And I had to be really honest about that. Um, It was not pretty because I just... Like, that's just not how I envisioned motherhood for me. Um, I didn't envision being a co-parent with my daycare provider. Um, So anyway, let's getting back to feminism and all these women being in the workforce. That shouldn't probably be there. Um, They're not embracing their vocation as mothers the way that they should be. They They should be at home raising their children. Like, that's just the reality of it. That's what we're called to. That's our primary vocation. And... I I wouldn't have said I was totally opposed to that. I was one of those women. So in my feminist mindset, I would have said, yeah, like women can do anything, right? And I'm not saying that they can't. The question isn't always whether or not we can. But often the question really is, should we? Right? I tell my kids this all the time. I have a one kid who's very impulsive. And I find myself saying often, the, honey, the question isn't whether or not you can. The question is, should you? You know, and I think for us as adults, we still grapple with that. And these women would not be in the workforce the way that they are if it weren't for abortion and contraception. Those things are the foundations of what allows women to continue to be in the workforce today. Full stop, full, period, full stop, that's it. If it were not for contraception and abortion, you would not have young women in the workforce in the manner that they are today. Because women know intuitively when you have more children, you kind of need to stay home. I mean, you can't offset the expenses of daycare with um, work often. I mean, it's super expensive. You're not just talking about daycare expenses. You're talking about additional gas, probably. You're talking about um, eating out more a lot of the time because both both parents are burned out at the end of the day and the only time they get to spend the only way they can spend time together during the week is if you're not worrying about cooking meals you know it's stuff like that where it really does add up significantly more so than than I think a lot of people expect I know it was more than we had expected um I I was earning a fair amount of I mean for a, working for a nonprofit I was earning a good salary and I was traveling the country. I was staying at the Ritz Carlton in Orlando. You know, it's like the kinds of things that young 20 something year olds would just think is amazing, right? And I was doing that. Um, and when I walked away from it, it was difficult. And I realized in those long days of being at home with my children, and I'm not going to pretend like it's not easy, or I'm sorry, I'm not going to pretend like it is easy because it's not. Those days, like like Daria being up all night with her little super cute and chunky Bernadette, um, the days can be really long and difficult and tedious and menial. And yet that's where 
we're being sanctified. You know, like I feel like women are missing out on all these graces that they could be give it, getting through motherhood in a different sense. And I find it so interesting that, you know, women today would rather be a slave to their boss than to their family. Why is it that women would rather be serving somebody who is not entitled to their care and they would shirk the responsibility and the duties that they have to their children and relegate them to somebody else? Like I said, I'm not saying that every woman is willingly, eagerly doing this, but the sad reality is is that women on average today that are my age, I'm a young millennial, they're waiting longer to have children because they're focused on their education and career. Needlessly, I would add. Um, you know, here I am. I'm a, a college graduate and I'm glad I went to college. You know, I don't, I, I wouldn't say I regret that. Um, I do regret waiting as long as I did to get married. And I was 21 when I got married. <laughs> and I still feel like my husband and I should have gotten married earlier. People think I'm crazy when I say that. But that's like my biggest regret is that we didn't get married earlier, to be honest. Um, who knows? I probably have one or two more kids by now. Oh, it's just crazy. Um, you know, but those are the things it's like, what do I want to be the legacy of my life? And I, I was just reflecting the other day. It was a difficult day and it really, the Holy Spirit kind of laid it on me that like our children are the jewels that we wear in our crown. Like when we die and I get, you know, sadly, some people struggle with having children. I'm not saying that the more children you have, the more jewels in your crown you have, but our children and having a spirit of uh, spiritual motherhood, even making those sacrifices and denying yourself the way that you have to as a mother as as how we're called to being creatures who are ordered towards being nurturing and tending to the needs of other people. Just like Our Lady at the Wedding of Cana, being so hyper aware of the situation and trying to mitigate catastrophe for the wedding couple, right? Like women, when we have embraced our vocation, whether it is in a physical sense or a spiritual sense, we're prone to that. And that's where we get our, you know, those those jewels in our crown, the, the things that we can come to the Lord at the end of our lives and say, I, I gave everything that I have and I served, right? Which brings me to my next point. In St. Pope John Paul II's, or I guess some people, I think you're supposed to say Pope St. John Paul II. There we go. In his uh, writing Mulieris Dignitatum, I don't know if you've ever read it. I totally recommend you do if you haven't. Um, but he has a whole section He's talking about Our Lady and the Theotoko, being the Theotokos, the mother of God, and her being the perfect example for women to understand how to embrace femininity, right? Embrace motherhood. And he says here, to serve means to reign. And we think of Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, serving. And it is in her service that she reigns, right? And I think any woman in her home realizes how much she is the glue that keeps the home together, right? Like for me, when my husband comes home, oh, I hate this. When he calls me on his way home, not that I hate it when he calls me. I love it. But if I've had a really rough day, I always am torn. Like, do I tell him how bad my day has been? Or do I sort of like soft sell, like not really acknowledge how bad it's been? Because I know that if I tell him I've had a horrible day, he's going to come home upset and he is going to be extremely short with our children. He's going to have a short fuse, right? Like it's in those things where I realize I'm kind of the glue that keeps the peace in my home. So to serve means to reign. And a lot of the time that means dying to yourself. I'm horrible at this. Like, I'm not saying this to anyone because I'm perfect at it. I'm so far from. Like, I honestly am the worst. I'm, I complain all the time. I struggle with being present to my children every day, it seems like. I just, there are so many chances I sense that tug in my heart to stop what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm definitely a Martha. Like, I, I need to get all the things done and then I can attend to the other things, right? And... 
I'm not serving my children the way that I need to be. And women today, we don't want to serve, right? It's totally Satan. I will not serve, right? That's the pride that he expressed. And it has really been, it is ingrained into feminism. I will not serve, right? They want to be served. Women want to they want to reign, but without serving. They want to be served. And it is a complete inversion of what we're called to as women, not because we're less than men. It's, it's not that at all. Women, are, you know, men too, they have to serve. They have to provide. They have to work. They have to toil um, in, in a different way to provide for, their means of, for, for the means of their families and things like that. Um, that's actually, a, in a lot of ways, a very great burden um, because they will be held to a higher account in a sense, I think, um, because they, they are the head of the home. They're, they're the ones that kind of, you know, you know, if you've ever been a, a manager of a project and the project fails, the manager will be held accountable, right? And we see that kind of in the home. So Pope St. John Paul II in his section on to serve means to reign, he writes, um, when Mary responds to the words of the heavenly messenger with her fiat, she who is full of grace feels the need to express her personal relationship to the gift that has been revealed to her saying, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. This statement should not be deprived of its profound meaning, nor should it be diminished by artificially removing it from the overall context of the event and from the full content of the truth revealed about God and man. In the expression of In the expression, handmaid of the Lord, one senses Mary's complete awareness of being a creature of God. The word handmaid near the end of the Annunciation Dialogue is inscribed throughout the whole history of the mother and the son. In fact, this son, who is the true and consubstantial son of the Most High, will often say of himself, especially at the culminating moment of his mission, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. So this is really stark contrast uh, when we compare birthing person's day <laughs> and like what motherhood is supposed to be and that reverence that, that is due to true motherhood. Um, and all these things, going back to the divorce of who we are as human beings and our identity made as in the image of God having a body and a soul that are perfectly integrated. When you divorce sex from its natural end, being procreation through things like abortion and contraception, you're naturally going to see this disorder. Like, it's so interesting around the same time as as Mother's Day is coming out. now, Now the data is in on the corona baby boom. And did it happen? Absolutely not. Sadly, the U.S. birth rate birth rate dropped 4% to a record low in 2020, the steepest decline since 1979, according to the CDC data. I wish I could say I'm surprised, but I'm not. I've been working in the pro-life movement for about a decade now, which is crazy, but as someone who's been working in the pro-life movement, I've seen the women. I mean, I've I ran a pregnancy center for a couple of years. I do sidewalk counseling. I've talked to people on college campuses about, about abortion and done outreach. I've I've honestly pretty much done everything under the sun. And the reality is, is that women don't want to have children. Okay, I don't care if you lock them up in their homes with their boyfriends or their husbands. Women are not having children. They don't want children. They want to go to school. They want to have an education. They think it is their right to do whatever they want with their bodies. Hedonism and licentiousness rule the day. And reason and logic have yet to prevail. Not only that, but love has yet to prevail in their hearts. It's like they're running from themselves. I... (laughs) And I, you know, I've been there too. Like I've run, I've run away from myself too. I think often because we think we're not worthy of being loved, right? Like there's that father wound. There's so often a mother wound and we don't know how to be mothers. And so we run away from it. And we pursue these other things because they seem to be a greater good. They seem to be something that we have more control over. And we're told 
that when we are working, when we're pursuing an education, it, it's in those things that we meet our, we, we are living out and we're living to our potential. I remember kind of feeling that way when I started staying home with the kids, like, like somehow I wasn't going to be meeting my potential. I was made for more. I remember t- being told from the time I was a very young child by teachers and things like that, oh, you're going to do such great things. And to me, that never meant you're going to be such a great mom. And I don't think that that's what it meant to them either. Like it it always, it was understood by both me, the child, and, and the teacher or the person expressing it. Like you're going to do great things in the world. But my greatness wasn't necessarily going to be found in my children, right? And in the gift that they are to the world. And the sad thing is too, is that, you know, in a secular sense, when you see the birth rate continue to drop, and we're in a world right now where fertility is significantly below uh, replacement rate. I mean, our elderly population, and I've been saying this for years, our, our elderly population, people are getting older and they're living longer, and there's more elderly than there are young people coming in to replace. So what's going to happen to our economy as, oh my gosh, as if our economy isn't already collapsing. But this is really the groundwork. Envision it kind of like an inverted triangle, right? You have the elderly people on top. And as you go down are the people supporting the generation that came before them. What happens when you just don't have enough people to support the elderly people who are retiring and needing health care and they're living longer and they need health care longer? I mean, it is the perfect storm for total collapse of the economy because you know, human beings are capital. We put into this, we, we spend money in the economy, you're building things, the innovation, all of that stuff. Um, when you don't have that or when you have less of that, you just can't meet the demand. You, you won't be able to meet the demand that will exist. And, you know, that's, that's a, aside from all the other craziness that we have going on right now. So um, I guess in this whole reflection... <laughs> I don't want it to be a total, uh, I don't know, downer, even though that's kind of how I felt on Mother's Day. It was sort of like, why are we celebrating a day in a country? Why are we celebrating Mother's Day in a country and in a world that actually hates motherhood and is doing everything in its power to kill motherhood, right? Um, But what I want to leave you with is something good and holy, which is our, Our Lady, of course, someone to look to who can show us the way, right? Like she shows us in her fiat the way and it is in those little things. <laughs> I was really moved today. My my oldest, we struggle with her. She's extremely, um, she can be very difficult sometimes. And then we have these glimmers where, uh, and I'm sure every parent has this, where you're like, wow, that is my child. And they are showing me Jesus. And what, what happened was my young, my youngest daughter, who is, in those terrible twos, she took her plate of eggs and was mad and just picked it up, tipped the fl- plate and w- dumped all of her eggs on the floor everywhere <laughs> and then dropped the plate and walked away. And I was trying to convince her to clean them, clean up her mess. And my oldest started cleaning it up for her. And she said, it's okay, mama. She doesn't need to help. I'll clean it up for her. And she started talking about how this is something little that she can do for Jesus. This is a little thing she can do. Um, and I thought, oh my goodness, here is my child showing me in the, in the spirit of St. Therese of Lisieux, um, the little way. And I think as mothers and, and even men in this culture today, like we have to focus on the little way of doing little things and some of us being called to big things to show the beauty of motherhood and of femininity, of not being divorced, our bodies and our souls, our, the nature of human sexuality, embracing who we are because motherhood is nothing without fatherhood. And men need to stand up as, as patriarchs in their homes to, to protect motherhood. Honestly, we need more men protecting motherhood instead of capitulating to the demands of those screeching feminists. (laughs) And women have to find ways to embrace being mothers. And that's not easy. We live in a culture, even even 
if you're a Catholic, like I am, and I've always been Catholic, um, where I sort of have, had imbibed a lot of these ideas without realizing it, um, resisting my own motherhood. And I still do it when I, when I choose to focus on folding laundry when my kids need me emotionally for something, right? Um, or I, because I just want to get the thing done. I, I know it'll still be there later, and I don't want it to be there later. But the reality is, is that their laundry is always going to be there. There will always be laundry to do. There will always be dishes to do. I will never not have dishes to do, right? Not until I die. <laughs> um, and it really is in serving and dying to ourselves. And that doesn't always mean letting people walk all over you and take advantage of you. You know, boundaries are important. And you have to find ways to also take care of yourself because you cannot, you simply can't give what you don't have, right? Like I can't be run down by my family and the demands of having four young children um, without filling up on good spiritual things, right? And and fraternity, you know, with my, with my dear friends, the people who help me keep focus, you know, good holy friends. And my husband who is, I swear he's going straight to heaven because he's married to me. <laughs> um, but to always remember that to serve is to reign for each of us. Um, even if you're a man, you, you can emulate Our Lady too. You have your own fiat that you have to offer. And it is our children that are the crowns of our lives, whether they're our physical children or spiritual children. And I just want to encourage you today that our world needs mothers more than ever, doesn't it? Like if you look around, I think the thing that I see the most wanting there's two things. Fathers, like real fatherhood, masculine fatherhood, where men are taking control and being intentional about protecting and providing for their families. But also motherhood, like nurturing and true compassion, not compassion without truth. Um, you know, the, well, if, if that's what you want, then I support you kind of a thing. But looking for the objective good for our children, like willing good things for them so that they can attain holiness and, and redemption, salvation. Um, and I will encourage you not that, oh, I want to say this last part too, before, uh, before I, I close here, because Daria doesn't know this, but I'm, I'm plugging her new devotional. I don't know if you guys saw her new devotional. Um, she has a devotional that she titled at his feet. Or I don't know if she published or titled it that or the publisher, but at his feet and in it there is a a quote that she she writes about in there and I it has been mulling over and over and over I have recalled it to mind several times since I read it and she was talking about this difficulty that we so often have in giving ourselves we resist like we feel entitled to our own time right? I find that a lot. I call it time entitlement. I didn't realize I suffered from this for so long until one day it hit me like, why does it bo bother me so much when people disrupt what I'm doing? Well, it's because I feel entitled to my time. But really, my time is not my time, especially not when it comes to my children. It is theirs. They are entitled to it. They are entitled to me. Um, so the quote that she talks about is a, a couple of lines, but the one that stuck out to me was, where there is love, there is no labor. Where there is love, there is no labor. And I want to have that mindset. And that's what I'm stri striving for. Like I'm striving to grow in this mindset. Where there is where there is love, there is no labor. Um, and I look to Our Lady, of course, for this as an example. To St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta for this example. And I look for people in my own life where I think, wow, they give of themselves so freely. Like I have this neighbor whose daughter is very autistic and I watch her walk by my house every day. Her daughter is severely, can't talk, um, has, has a feeding tube, all kinds of things. I mean, it's very severe. Her daughter is in her early twenties and I see her walking outside my window every day with her daughter, giving of herself that way because her daughter loves to go on walks. And as she pushes her daughter and like one of those little they're kind of like the tent stroller things. Um, I think, wow, she's been 
giving so sacrificially to her daughter in a way that like I, I take for granted. I don't, I don't have a child that has severe special needs and I still resist. I need to learn that where there is love, there is no labor. And I need to learn how to love. And I need to look to our lady and our Lord who gave of himself and redeemed us by his precious blood on the Holy Cross because he loved us passionately. You know, to passion actually means to suffer and compassion being to suffer with. And that's where I have to grow. And I'm encouraging you and everyone else who's listening to join me kind of in this way of the little way, like St. Therese and like my daughter just picking up the eggs off of the floor to realize that to serve is to reign. And it is in serving that we will bear witness to the world, our motherhood, our fatherhood, whether it be physical, spiritual, um, and really in that way, bring Christ to the world. So with that, I'm, I want you to join me. Hopefully, if you know a little bit of Latin, maybe you can pray the Ave Maria with me. And we can ask Our Lady in this month of May to help us on this journey to grow in holiness in our own fiat and to embrace service because where there is love, there is no labor. In nomine Padres et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, in benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Padres et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Thanks for joining me today on Live a Little. If you liked what you heard, please hit subscribe. Uh, make sure you're, you know, you hit the bell and you're getting notifications whenever we publish. And please share this with your friends and family if you liked it. Uh, we can't grow this without you. So please join us on this uh, mission to pass along the torch from generation to generation of saints uh, so that we can be the best saints that we can be today to live Live the gospel of life. So God bless you. Thanks for joining me. Take care.